We are an extraordinary grassroots campaign. We are built from mouse pads, shoe leather, and hope. And like the founders of the Republic, we seek change. You have the power to restore our nation to fiscal sanity and bring jobs back to our people. You have the power to fulfill Harry Truman's pledge of health care for all Americans. You have the power to give us foreign policy consistent with American values again. You have the power to take our country back. You have the power. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're going to take our country back. Thank you very much. I think he really wants to bring back the values that we had as kids. Howard has a great family. Uh, I remember when I first went out to their house on Long Island, um, first time I ever met them, and they were just the most welcoming people in the world. It was like, you're Howard's friend, you must be wonderful. Our family was a close family. Um, we had, it was sort of came in two sets. It was Howard and Charlie, and then it was my brother Billy and I. It was like two little families, the two little ones were crazy about Howard because he was very kind to them. <laughs> Howard was not your ordinary older brother. Uh, he was someone who didn't just help us out when we were having a scrape with another kid in the neighborhood. He was a guy that really took a lot of interest in our own lives. He often came to my defense, uh, which was great, especially since I'm the youngest and uh, I could have used it. We were outdoors all the time because uh, we grew up in a place, Eastern Long Island, uh, that didn't have any televisions. It had one channel, Channel 8 from New Haven, which was so fuzzy, it was like being in a snowstorm. And we used to talk a lot about politics um, at the dinner table. Dad was actually quite a conservative uh, uh, political person. Howard was 17. He turned into kind of a hippie. <laughs> he got himself a, well, it sounds like nothing now, but he had a, a you know, a denim blue jean jacket and pants, and that was all new to all of us then. So he sort of took that turn, and that was, I mean, looking back on it, it was quite funny, but his father was kind of horrified at the time. Howard is where he is today because he felt the call of certain things along the way. Well, I met Howard for the first time in September of 1967. It was certainly the most important year that I was in college, but it may have been one of the most important years I spent. Uh, in my life. In our freshman year, Martin Luther King was assassinated. Shortly after our freshman year, Bobby Kennedy was assassinated. These were really troubling times. I distrusted, interestingly enough, politicians at the time uh, because I thought they were, more, they were wedded to ideas but not human beings. And so I started tutoring uh, my freshman year. And then ultimately I went on and did some student teaching in one of the New Haven uh, middle schools which was a great experience because I'm sure I'm the only presidential candidate that actually has had to stand for five hours without being able to go to the bathroom. My brother Charlie was very idealistic and very hard-nosed. Um, he was very stubborn, which I think came from being 16 months younger than the older person, which was me. So we had plenty of disagreements. But as he grew older, the thing that I admired about him the most is that he believed it wasn't just important to talk about doing the right thing, that he actually wanted to do something about it, and he did. Charlie went to Laos and was taking a tour down the Mekong River with a guide and he was uh, captured by the insurgency group, the Path at Lao. Uh, he was held for uh, three or four months in a village and we knew where he was, we just couldn't get him. Uh, when we discovered that he was missing, my father went first and then my mother went later to see what they could do about uh, getting him released. He was uh, later taken up to a town in Laos, and on his way to that town, he was killed. It was devastating for the whole family. A loss like that is awful for the siblings, and it's worse for the parents. Um, my husband didn't ever want to discuss it. So I think what happened was that the boys got together over it. I think the four of them, I mean, the three of them, um, talked about it a lot, and Howard was very helpful to them. 
You have to decide that you're going to move on. You're going to learn the things that you can learn from your, uh, the, 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 your loved one's life and take those gifts that that person has given you and then uh, use those gifts. After what happened to Charlie, Howard made a decision um, to become a doctor. He was working in Wall Street. He worked there for two years and he was pretty good at it too. I wanted to get back into a life where I thought I was contributing something to other people. Uh, the people on Wall Street wanted him to become more of an analyst and maybe a fund manager at some point. Uh, meanwhile, he was sneaking up to Columbia at night and taking all the pre-med courses like uh, biochemistry and, and all those things that he hadn't taken at Yale. And he wanted to help as many people as possible. He chose a field like family medicine, which allows him access to a very broad part of the population. It includes treating children, treating adults, treating elderly, treating pregnant women and delivering babies. It's a field that you don't see many people going into. And then he kept right on going. And then he met Judy, that kept him there. <laughs> Uh, the first time I really noticed her, I said to my friend, that girl's adorable. And so I promised myself that if she was in the library after I, you know, admired her from afar for a while, if she was in the library on a certain night, I was going to ask her out. One Friday night I was in the library and um, I had just been thinking that um, I wasn't meeting a lot of people at medical school and I thought to myself, well, the next time someone asked me to do something in medical school, I will. So I walked in, she was sitting in the library, and I said, would you like to come to dinner? And she said, yes. That's how it started. She was a year behind him, and um, I guess they fell in love. They were a very special couple. I think everybody in the class felt that they were ideal for each other. We come from such different families. I come from this waspy family that's, you know, 300 years in America. She comes from a family where her grandmother came over at age 17, escaping one of the pogroms in Russia. Uh, and yet our values are the same. We're very, very family oriented. And he's very, very energetic. He likes to get things done. So he'll come in and he'll, I'll sort of have a list of things that are going wrong, like the sink's leaking or something like that. He'll fix all that. And, and um, one morning I looked out the window about 6.30 in the morning and he was on his was supposed to be on a flight to Iowa in about half an hour. I looked out the window, he was mowing the lawn in his suit um, just so it would get done before he left. And they, they worked very well as a team and uh, I had to laugh when I heard that story because I could, I could just see it happening. We shared a practice in this office um, for a few years and we shared patients and um, the patients adored him. Once he became a doctor and he got settled in Vermont and he got married, I think the instinct of the rest of this family was to think, great, he's on his way to the rest of his life. And then this little thing came up about running for the legislature. Medicine and politics are two branches of the same thing. You go into medicine to make people's lives better. I've always been really interested in changing the world, making it a better place. But the question is how you do that. And there are two ways to do it. One, you can do it one life at a time. That is, you're a good parent, you work hard at it, you're in a helping profession, like being a physician or being a teacher. Um, or you can do what I do. You can try to achieve social change um, of the kind we did in Vermont. When he was lieutenant governor, he was really happy because he could practice medicine and he could see a lot of the kids and drive them back and forth to school and go take them to soccer and that kind of thing and be lieutenant governor. I mean, it was a perfect life for him. In one of the speeches he was giving one time when his kids were little, and obviously wanted to be close to him. So he's up in front addressing a joint House and Senate meeting, and his little daughter is sitting underneath the podium coloring. That's Howard Dean. I was doing a physical on a patient. The phone rang at about 10 past 8 in the morning, and the nurse knocked on the door and said, you have the governor's office on the line. It's with one of the governor's aides, and he said, I'm sorry to have to inform you that the governor's died. I actually went back and finished the physical, knowing that that was the last patient I was going to see, maybe ever. And um, he came home that weekend, which was nice because his father was there. And his father was, was I think, a, a, you know, a very strong, positive person that if Howard ever had to lean on anybody, he could lean on, even though they had their differences of, you know, political differences and so forth. And then he went back to Vermont. Howard became governor when the state of Vermont and once again the country were in a terrible deficit situation. He was immediately uh, tested by fire. I mean, what he inherited was a fiscal nightmare. 
he just does not see any obstacle as being too great to overcome. Instead of saying, let's raise a lot of taxes, uh, let's cut a lot of human service, let's hurt people, he set about a program to balance the state budget while maintaining vital services to people that needed them. It made all the difference in the world. And it was his leadership that got Vermont from record deficit to a record surplus, and he did that in two or three years. And it's totally because of Howard Dean. One of the things I'm most proud of in Vermont is that in four areas I left the state in a better place than I found it. Tons of undeveloped land forever, kids with health insurance and early intervention to keep prisons down, and a fiscal uh, stability that has lasted us through this horrible recession without having to cut health care and education. I think he grew in the understanding that he could make a difference. Well, I think he's just passionate about helping people. He's very direct. He's very honest. If he said he was going to do something, he would do it. The guy works harder, faster, uh, and longer than just about anybody else around. I think he really believes that he can make a difference. He just treats every individual with respect. And it comes back to his core values are so clear. He knows what he wants. He knows where he wants to go. And he inspires people to go with him. And I ask all Americans, regardless of party, to meet with me across this nation, to come together in common cause, to forge a new American century, help us in the quest for return to greatness, and return high moral purpose to the United States of America. You have the power to reclaim our nation's destiny. You have the power to rid Washington of the politics of money. You have the power to make right just as important as might. You have the power to give America a reason to vote again. And you have the power to take the White House back in 2004. You have the power to take this country back. You have the power. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. We're going to take our country back. What's amazing tonight as you look around your meetup is not that all of you have come together in your community to campaign and organize for Howard Dean. That's pretty amazing, but what's really amazing is that the same thing's happening in 850 cities and towns and meetups across the country tonight. Last month, you did something else that was amazing. You just made the toughest and most important decision our campaign probably will make, the decision to forego public financing and to carry the burden of financing this campaign ourselves so that we can compete with George Bush's $200 million and take on the attack that Karl Rove and the gang are going to throw at us. That's a, a, a burden now that we all need to carry. And there's a simple way of doing it. It's not to get supporter after supporter to give more and more, although if people can do that, we need you to do it. What we need to do now is grow. We need to grow to 2 million Americans each prepared to give $100 and contribute that $100 to our campaign. Because if 2 million Americans do that, if 2 million Americans contribute $100, we'll have $200 million and we'll be able to stand toe to toe with George Bush. That's the next, next great step that this campaign must make to be competitive and to actually win in November. But to get there, we've got to do two things simultaneously. We've got to grow our numbers and get people to understand the $100 revolution the $100 revolution of 2 million Americans giving $100. That's the one thing we have to do. But simultaneously, we, have, we need your help to win Iowa and New Hampshire. You have made a tremendous difference. It's the meet-up letters that have bolted us into a situation where in Iowa we're competitive, but it's going to be a dogfight with Dick Gephardt. It's those same kinds of letters that have moved us into a double-digit lead against John Kerry in New Hampshire. It was those letters that gave us the personal contact we needed with voters in Iowa and New Hampshire to make Howard Dean competitive and take the lead in New Hampshire. Now we need your help again. You need to stay focused. We need everybody in this campaign right now not to lose their focus and to understand that no matter what's going on in their local state, as important as that is, winning Iowa is the most important thing and then winning New Hampshire becomes the next most important thing. We need your help. We've got, uh, we need to, you, I know people are tired of writing these letters, but we need you to keep doing it. 
It's the most important thing you can do for us right now. And in January, we're going to need your help again to help us get out the vote in Iowa and New Hampshire and do other last minute tasks that will help the governor uh, and our campaign emerge victorious in those two key states. If we can win Iowa and New Hampshire and start to build a $100 revolution to compete with George, George Bush's special interest in corporate bundled money, we will not only win the nomination, we'll go all the way to the White House and you will have carried us there. Uh, I want to thank you on behalf of the governor and the rest of the team here in Burlington. But more importantly, you owe each other a debt of gratitude for what you've done to help make our campaign stronger and what you've done to change America's politics forever. I believe firmly that there are two million Americans who would gladly borrow a hundred dollars and contribute it to the Dean campaign to defeat George Bush and put Governor Dean in the, in the White House carrying our values and our principles. That's what our task is now, to win Iowa, to win New Hampshire, and to begin the $100 revolution. City and state of Madison, Wisconsin, and I'm glad to be here in support of Howard Dean for presidency. It's time our country take back America and elect a president who supports average Americans and not think corporations or special interest groups. A president who supports minorities and civil rights, and a, and a government, a governor, or a president who supports the people. Jerome Wiley Segovia. I'm here from Silver Spring, Maryland, and I'm here because it's time for Latinos to uh, not only vote for ourselves, but also we represent Latinos who are not able to vote yet at this time. Uh, thank you very much. Hi, I'm Lanya Shapiro. I'm here from Durham, North Carolina, and I've been following Howard Dean for over a year. My mom first called my attention to the fact that he has been, as a governor, was an outspoken advocate for, for gay youth. And uh, then hearing his support, uh, his, his opposition to the war really got my attention. And there's so many things since then that I've learned about Howard Dean's stance that I love. And this is just one example, um, giving the power of this huge decision to the people who are supporting the campaign. I had a, a professor, a mentor of mine, say, you know, opting out is going to set campaign finance reform back 10 years, and, and I actually have to disagree. I think this is campaign finance reform, and we are owning this. Hi, my name is Jasper Hendricks. I'm from Farmville, Virginia. Uh, I stand here today, firmly standing here today, behind our future president, Governor Howard Dean of Burlington, Vermont. Um, I stand here very passionate um, about his cause and, and about what he believed in. Um, I got started in, with this campaign, um, volunteering, um, kind of from a whim. You know, I was at Norfolk State. I had a good life, great job, um, living a single life. And then I started reading about this guy named Howard Dean, a um, medical doctor from Vermont who is the governor. And um, I started looking at the, his youth involvement, and um, I did a lot of youth, youth um, stuff in Virginia, and people started calling me and asking me questions. You know, what do you think about the 2004 election? And I told them, well, the only way that people will win, a person will win in 2004, is if, if they do what this guy named Howard Dean is doing in Vermont. <laughs> and from there, you know, I was asked to do a sleepless summer. And um, I still wasn't fully committed, but then after I heard him speak, and I realized that he was very passionate, 
and you can feel the words. And I was standing at, on the stage and I just wanted to cry, but I was on national television, so I couldn't cry. <laughs> As a Southern African American male who have talked to my colleagues on the different boards that I do serve on, I do, and I'm proud to say that we are behind Howard Dean all the way until 2004. Regina. <laughs> I'm Kim Hines from Stanford, Connecticut. I'm a Meta Post uh, Congressional District organizer with the towns, um, a house party organizer, all kinds of things. But quite simply, I just am so happy I have found a candidate with passion, integrity, and the bravery to stand up for what's right. I'm Alden Hines, also from Stamford, Connecticut, and I'm just so excited to be part of the campaign that includes everyone and gives everyone a chance to get involved and not a campaign just for the extremely wealthy or the special interests, but that is open to everyone to come out and join us. Port Angeles, Washington, and I also represent Port Townsend, Washington. And I would like to introduce a candidate who really cares about what we think. And the reason I know that he cares is because he asks us every day in communications, on the blog, in emails, in telephone conferences, and person to person. I would like to introduce the next President of the United States. not just a long geographic distance, but a long uh, distance in terms of a leap of faith. This really is a movement to, uh, to take our uh, country back. And one of them said to me as we were coming out, thank you for how far you've come. And I said, no, it's not how far I've come, it's how far we've come. And this campaign is about us, not about one person. It's about all of us. This is a movement for every American to take their country back from special interests. Today, by a margin of 85% to 15%, the people who made this campaign possible have voted to decline public financing. We have supported public financing, but the unabashed actions of this president to undercut our democratic process with floods of special interest money have forced us to abandon a broken system. Our campaign has not just been about talking about campaign finance reform. We have campaign finance reform. Our campaign is campaign finance reform. Over 200,000 people have given us an average of $77 to bring us here, and now they have overwhelmingly refused to be intimidated by George Bush and his cronies giving him $2,000 a piece. This started in Vermont, and it couldn't have been possible without, and I hate to quote a Republican president, but I'm going to, what Calvin Coolidge called, said about Vermont was this, it couldn't have been possible without the courage. Calvin Coolidge said about Vermont, if this country should ever fail and lack courage, they can find an ample store in the brave people in the small little state of Vermont. Thank you. The people who build a campaign have themselves made one of the most important decisions for the campaign. The people who built this campaign are the people who have pledged their support, donated what they could afford, written letters, and are now knocking on people's 
doors in Iowa and New Hampshire, where some of these folks are going after they get done here. <laughs> they have said that we should decline federal funds. And now we have to support this entire campaign on our own. Our campaign was created during a troubled time in our history, a time when members of our own party in Congress and the Republic's guardians in the media have failed to debate and question the wisdom of a president who misled this nation into an unnecessary war. Our campaign has been built at a time when the majority of Americans have become alienated or completely dropped out of our political process. We know no system of self-government can operate without free and vigorous debate. Nor can our republic be strong without full citizen participation in our political system. The campaign has not only broken fundraising records. We've begun to reconnect the bonds between our citizens and establish a new communication between citizens and their elected officials. We have taken a big step in winning back our government so that it works not solely for the profit of a few multinational corporations, but for the benefit of all of us. Only when people have regained control of their government can true campaign finance reform be enacted. Thomas, Je Thomas Jefferson wrote two centuries ago that whenever people are well informed, they can be trusted with their own government. Whenever things go so far wrong as to attract their notice, they may be relied upon to set them to right. So with this campaign, we hope to attract the notice of the people of the United States. We trust that just as they have always done in the past, that they will set things right. We have only started. This decision that we means that we have many, many challenges ahead of us. We must expand the campaign from hundreds of thousands to tens of millions. Our goal is to match George Bush. But instead of getting $2,000 checks from the heads of all the major corporations in the country, we ask 2 million Americans to give us $100. And we believe that 2 million Americans will borrow $100 simply for the pleasure of sending this president back to Crawford, Texas. of independence from the special interests that control our politics and our government. We will pledge to write letters, to knock on doors, to educate our neighbors and our co-workers, and we will pledge to vote. We will become active citizens again. We will take back our country. We will look hard for two million Americans to give this campaign $100 so that we can own our country again. Thank you very much. which have connected them with, with another. A decent respect to the opinions of mankind requires 
that they should declare the cause which impelled them to the separation. Two centuries ago, our founders brought into this world a new republic. This republic brought to the world a new era of self-government. It assures the rights of the citizenry and gave them the vote to elect representatives. Throughout this nation's history, the American people have struggled to keep their rights and make their government work for them. We have seen the populist, progressive, women, labor, and civil rights movements. Today, our government has become overrun by special interests. Working with President George Bush to turn our government into a system that works for the profit of the few and not the benefit of the many. They have in the two elections flooded our politics with over $5.1 billion in contributions. They have walked into the Vice President's office and written energy legislation that keeps up shackled to fossil fuels. They have written health care legislation denying excess affordability and keeping prescriptions away from seniors. They have proposed, they have purposely misled this nation into an unnecessary war. We, therefore, the architects and builders of Dean for America, appealing to the wise judgment of the American people on our intentions to do in the name and by the authority of the good people of this, these United States, solemnly publish and declare the people of these United States are and the right ought to be free and independent of special interest, interests, and that as a free and independent citizen, they have full power to participate, deliberate, pursue the common good, protect their own interests from corruption, and to do all others acts and things which independent citizens may of right do. And for the support of this declaration, we mutually pledge to each other to write letters, knock on doors, organize our neighbors, self-fund this effort, and vote. Signed this day by all of us. <laughs>